today we're going to start first talking about commitment schemes and how we have already used commitment schemes and in which situations we can use them and when they're not even applicable. And then if we have time, we will talk more about random number generation, which was the topic of the previous session. So what do we use commitment schemes for? So remember, generally, whenever I have a commitment scheme, the idea is that I want to commit to something, but I want to hide it at the same time. So I have a value, and for some reason, I want to make sure that I cannot change it, but at the same time, I want to also make sure that other people cannot see what the value is. And of course, the way we do this is using a hash function. So I will just take my value, and I will take some nonce, and I will hash them together, and then I would announce that hash. Right. Now, in most cases, we're actually using this to simulate simultaneous action. What do I mean by this? So for example, consider the simple case of playing rock, paper, scissors, okay? So let's say I have two players, Alice and Bob. Okay. And well, in the real world, if I want to play rock, paper, scissors normally, the way it works is that Alice and Bob choose one of the three options at exactly the same time. Okay. So they have simultaneous action. Choose, let's say, our Alice, which is like either rock or paper or scissors, and our Bob, which is what Bob is playing, also rock or papers or scissors. And uh, they choose their uh, strategies basically at exactly the same time. Now, of course, the problem is that when you're implementing this as a smart contract, when you're working with the blockchain, there is no such thing as moving at the same time, right? There is even no concept of time in a sense. Of course, we have block numbers. We can have some approximation of time. We can say that some things happen at approximately the same time. So if two transactions are in the same block, probably the miner saw these two transactions at approximately the same time, right? Uh, but I cannot really have an order on this. Thing. So if I'm using a blockchain, I cannot be sure that if a function is called in my smart contract before another function, then the actual call was also made before. So uh, this was actually the basis of front running. It was the idea that maybe Alice makes the move first, but maybe Bob's move ends up getting to the smart contract first because the miner puts Bob's move before Alice's move into the block. Right? So basically I have an order on my moves and the order is always given to me by the miner. So all Alice and Bob can do is create transactions and publish those transactions, but ultimately the miners choose the order of those transactions. And so I cannot just have a simple smart contract in which Alice uh, gives her R value and Bob also gives his R value because one of them might just wait to first see the other person's R value and then choose their own value so that they win. Okay, so this is a very simple problem, of course. And the way we solved it was by having phases. So we said that I can control the time in the sense that in my smart contract, I can say this particular function can be called only between this block number and this block number. So I can have a time range based on the number of blocks. And I can say this function can only be called then. So I can define some phases and this is exactly what I needed to have a commitment scheme, right? So I can have a first phase, phase one. And in phase one, I say that Alice and Bob choose what they wanna play. So each player I chooses RI. This is what they want to play. And let's say they also choose some nonce, okay? and 
they also choose, let's say, a random nonce, and this nonce can be big, ni. And then they compute the hash of ri and ni. So they compute hi, which should be the hash. And again, we're just assuming that we have a predefined hash function. So let's say I'm using SHA-256. But I can use any cryptographic hash function here. I take the hash of ri and ni, and then basically announce this hash or commit to this hash in the smart contract. So uh, I use orange to write what's happening with the smart contract. So the player calls, let's say, a function called commit and gives it the value hi. Now, my functions are enforcing the phases. So this phase is from some starting block. So let's say b1 to b prime 1. Let's say this is my phase 1. And so whenever I'm calling the commit function, my smart contract will check that the current block number is between b1 and b prime 1. And it will just uh, revert the transaction if this is not the case. So for simplicity, let's say that I can do this for the first 10 blocks. So blocks 1 to 10, I can do this. So commit can only be called phase 1. And then I say that, of course, there is a reveal phase. And this is phase 2. And I'm going to enforce that this one can only happen between blocks, let's say, 11 to 20. And again, each player i reveals their actual strategy, ri, and also the nonce that they used, ni. And let's say this is by a function call, which is just doing reveal ri, ni. And now, what this function does on the smart contract is that first it checks that I'm in the correct phase. It checks that the block number is between 11 and 20, let's say. And then it also checks that uh, the hash matches. It checks that the hash of ri and ni would actually be the hi that was committed before. And then finally, I will have another phase after this. So let's say phase three. This is after time 20, so 21 to infinite. And here, basically, the winner can take the money. Winner takes everything. Okay, and of course, I could also have a phase zero in which the players sign up and maybe they give a deposit. So imagine that each one of them is putting down one ether at the very beginning, and then whoever wins can get two ethers. Okay, so phase zero is usually deposits and generally registration. Okay. Now, what's interesting to me, it's not this protocol itself, but the fact that we are kind of mimicking simultaneous action here, right? So each player is choosing the value of Ri, but we couldn't make them do this at the same time. But this is almost as good as having them do it at the same time, because in any case, every player is choosing the value of Ri in phase one. And in phase one, they don't know anything about the other player's value, right? So even if it's not really at the same time, in terms of the information that the players have at their disposal when they're making their choice, it's the same. It's as if it was simultaneous. Okay. Now, of course, we've seen other examples of this. Another example of this was the case of auction, right? So in an auction, I would actually have many players. So let's say I have N players. And the situation is, again, very similar. Each player has a bid. Let's call that, again, ri. So let's say player i wants to bid ri. OK? And again, we want them to do this at the same time. 
And the way that we mimic simultaneous action is by saying that, well, you all just use a commitment scene. So again, I will have phases and I'm not going to write the times. Whenever I talk about phases, just imagine that my smart contract is enforcing that, okay? So no phase can be run before uh, its time comes. And so I'm going to again have a commitment phase in which everyone commits to their value of Ri. So just like before, each player chooses a nonce. So player i chooses nonce ni and computes the hash of ri and ni, and then just commits to it. So, and again, this is going to be a call to the smart contract. So commit of hi. And then I'm going to have a, I guess, revelation phase or revealing phase in which they basically announce or reveal their values, reveal the ri and ni. And of course, then I can have another phase or maybe I'll just do it in the revealing phase. I find the uh, biggest bit, I find the largest bit and I say they want the whole thing, they want the, uh, the, the option. Okay, again, I'm just repeating myself over and over again here. You're just mimicking simultaneous action. The idea here is that it's as if the players are playing at the same time. It's as if they're all choosing the RI value at the same time. Because when they're choosing the, the RI value in the commitment phase, they don't know anyone else's RI value and they don't know anything about it. They have zero information about the other RIs. Okay. Now I'm going to give you an example where this doesn't really work. And this is the example of escrow. And we've kind of seen this before. So let's say that I have a buyer and a seller. So Alice wants to buy something from Bob. And let's say that this thing that she wants to buy is a physical object. It's not on the blockchain. It's not an NFT. I cannot check on the blockchain whether the item was actually delivered or not. Okay. So Alice wants to buy, let's say an apple from Bob. And let's say that she wants to pay one ether for the app. Okay, for one ether. Now, the problem is that they don't trust each other. So Alice is not willing to pay first because if she pays first, maybe Bob doesn't deliver the apple. Bob is not willing to de deliver the apple first because maybe Alice wouldn't pay. And you see, this can't be solved by just telling Alice to pay half of the money because uh, Bob still doesn't trust Alice. And if she pays only half of the money and he delivers the item, maybe she doesn't pay the rest, right? And also, again, Alice doesn't trust Bob, so she's not willing to pay half of the money anyway. So we want to have a situation where we can create some sort of trust here. And of course, the normal way of doing this is by centralization. So we're going to have a trusted third party. I'm not going to name any names. And basically, the way it works is that first, Alice pays this trusted third party. So Alice pays one ether to the trusted third party. And then the second step is that Bob sends the item to Alice. So Bob sends the apple to Alice. And then the trusted third party verifies that the item was delivered. And only if the item was delivered, they would pay Bob. So this is step three, but only if the item was there. And of course, there can be disagreement between Alice and Bob, but if there is any disagreement, the trusted third party is the one who's going to decide what to do. 
Now, of course, this is a blockchain course. We don't like to have trusted third parties. So the question, the natural question is, can I just have a smart contract that replaces this trusted third party? And the answer, well, at least the traditional answer to this was yes. And that's bit halo. Actually, this was a smart contract written in Bitcoin, but of course we can write anything in Ethereum as well because we have a Turing complete language. So the idea is very simple. The idea is that I first ask both sides to put down a deposit. Okay, so this is my first step. I say they both put down a deposit. Uh, let's say Alice pays two ether and Bob pays one ether. And these are both as deposits and they're paid to the smart contract. Okay. Now, already this is weird because the seller is also putting down a deposit. But that's the only way I can ensure that he's hopefully going to be honest because if someone doesn't put down a deposit, I have no way of actually penalizing them. If later on they do something dishonest, my protocol should be able to punish them. So I always need these uh, deposits to make sure I can punish the uh, dishonest players later on. And then let's say that I have a second phase in which Bob has some time to send the apple to Alice. Okay. And then after some time, again, all of these times are enforced by block numbers. So maybe I say after a number of blocks, which corresponds to approximately, let's say 24 hours, right? After some time, each side can tell the smart contract their point of view. So Bob can say, from my point of view, the item was fulfilled or it wasn't fulfilled. And Alice can say the same thing to the smart contract. And again, this is going to be a function call. So basically, each one of them is going to send just one bit of information to the smart contract. Each party, let's say I, which is either Alice or Bob, sends one bit, ri in zero to one, to the smart contract. And again, this is just telling the smart contract from my point of view, the item was delivered or not delivered. So zero means, let's say not fulfilled, and one means that it was fulfilled. Okay. Now, here's the part where the genius comes in. If the two parties agree, we don't have a problem, right? So this is phase four. If uh, both Alice and Bob say that the item was not delivered, then what does this mean? This means that well, Bob didn't send the apple to Alice and everyone agrees. Why did I write Alice twice? Uh, my hand does things that my mind doesn't want to. Okay. So if they both agree that the item was not delivered, we can just give them their money back, just refund the deposit. Okay. So if this is the case, the smart contract pays two ether to Alice and one ether to Bob. Okay, so just send back the deposit. Of course, we've had that lecture about pull over push and all of these things. So in practice, the way this is implemented is that there is a function where Alice can get two units back. Okay. Now, this case is easy. Of course, the other easy case is if they both agree that the item was fulfilled. So R Alice is equal to R Bob is equal to one. So Alice has already put a deposit of two ether to the smart contract and Bob has put a deposit of one ether. So now I can pay two to Bob and one to Alice and that would effectively be like transferring one unit 
or one ether from Alice to Bob, right? So in this case, it's also very easy. The smart contract pays uh, now one unit to Alice and two units or two ether to Bob. This is fine. But of course, the interesting case is when they don't agree. And when they don't agree, I would assume that Alice says the item is not given, the item is not fulfilled, but Bob claims that it was fulfilled. It's stupid if it's the other way around, but actually as, as far as our protocol is concerned, it can be the other way around as well. It's possible that Bob says, I didn't send the apple, but Alice says I received it, right? So in any case, if they don't agree, if our Alice is not equal to our Bob, then the smart contract basically burns all the money or locks all the money. Okay, so the smart contract locks the money. And when I say it locks the money, all I mean is that it doesn't let anyone withdraw the money. It doesn't transfer the money to anyone. It just keeps the money in the smart contract. And so no one can use that money anymore. That money is burned for a day. It's just stuck there for a day. Okay. Great. So now if you look at this, we can do a game theoretic analysis. We can do something like this. Let's look at it from the point of view of the two players. So Alice can say zero to the contract or she can say one. So this is Alice's choice. And then Bob can also say zero to the contract or he can say one, this is Bob's choice. And let's see what happens in each case. So, and I'm analyzing this after the deposits have been paid. So I'm just assuming that everyone has put the deposits in first. After the deposits have been paid, what's going to happen? Well, if they both say zero, they're both going to get their deposits back. So none of them made any money or lost any money. So the total payoff for Alice is zero and the total payoff for Bob is also zero. Okay. Now, if they both say one, basically Alice put in two units, but she got one unit back. So the total payoff for Alice is minus one, but the total payoff for Bob is one because he put in one unit and got two units back. And if they don't agree, then they're both just losing their deposits. So if they don't agree, Alice is losing two units, so that's minus two, and Bob is losing his deposit of one ether, so that's minus one. And this is the situation. So this is what we call a game matrix. You have two players. They each have different strategies. The strategies are either zero or one for Bob and either zero or one for Alice. But the payoff that they get is not only dependent on their own strategy, it's dependent on both strategies, right? So again, in each case here, the first number is Alice's payoff and the second number is Bob's payoff. And remember that in this course, we always assume rationality and rationality means that the players just care about their own payoffs. They just wanna maximize their own payoffs, okay? So here's how I can analyze this. I can say, suppose I'm Bob, and suppose that I know that Alice is honest. Okay. So I'm sure that Alice will tell zero or one based on what happened in the real world. Then if I'm rational, the best strategy for me is to also be honest. Now, why is that? So let's say, I have sent the item to Alice. Because Alice is honest, Alice is going to say one. But if Alice says one, then the game is going to be in here, right? So now I have two options. I can either say zero and get a payoff of minus one or say one and get a payoff of one. So it's in my best interest to just tell the truth. Of course, if I have sent the item, it's kind of obvious I should say that I have sent the item. But in the other case, the more interesting case, 
is that suppose I haven't sent the item. So Alice is honest. Alice says that I didn't receive the item. So the game is now in this column. Now as Bob, I can either say that I have sent the item, I can lie, or I can tell the truth and say I haven't sent the item. If I lie, I get a payoff of minus one. If I tell the truth, I get a payoff of zero. I'm rational, I want to maximize my payoff, so I would be honest, okay? So in this case, of course, the interesting point is if Alice and Bob act at the same time, I'm going to, of course, add the commitment scheme and all of those things so that I make sure that they're moving at the same time because, of course, if they don't move at the same time, then things are very different. But assuming that the strategies were chosen simultaneously and assuming that I know that Alice is honest, the best strategy for me as Bob is to also be honest. And you can do the same analysis from Alice's point of view. If Alice looks at this game and if Alice knows that Bob is honest, then the best strategy for Alice is also to be honest. Okay, so honesty is rational in this case. But of course, the problem with this argument is that I'm saying if the other side is honest, why would you assume that the other side is honest? It makes sense to assume that the other side is rational. The other side is just trying to maximize their own payoff. Why would I assume that they're honest? If they were honest, of course, it would be in my best interest to be honest too. But what if they're not necessarily honest? Well, in this case, Actually, Bob can kind of extort Alice, right? So here's what happens. Let's say I'm Bob, and let's say I'm a malicious Bob. I'm going to put down the deposit. Alice is also going to put down her deposit. And then I have time to send the apple to Alice. I don't send it. And then when we go to phase three, and remember that the, yes. But you make sure that um, it's putting out all these to collect the money and talk about the uh Oh, I see. So in the implementation, the way we would implement this is that we will actually have another phase between these two okay. so that if only one side put down the deposit and the other side didn't, then they can get their deposit back. Okay. So again, I'm really analyzing after the deposits have already been put there because I'm, I'm assuming that the deposits are there. Without the deposits, we don't have anything. We can't punish anyone. And yeah, that's actually a great question. If only one party puts down the deposit and the other party tries to cheat already at this stage, of course, we can just refund the party who put the deposit. Okay, so let's say again, I'm a malicious Bob. Alice has put down the deposit. I have put down the deposit. We've gone to stage two. I have time to send the apple to Alice. I don't because I'm malicious, right? Now, uh, Again, our phases are based on block numbers. So at some point, we're going to reach the block number which starts this phase, phase three. And at that point, I'm just going to create a transaction which lies and says that I have fulfilled the item. So I'm going to announce to the smart contract that our Bob is one. Now, as soon as this transaction is published, even before it's added to the blockchain, but more specifically, even after it is added to the blockchain, Alice sees this transaction, right? If the transaction is added to the blockchain, she definitely has seen it. But even before that, maybe she's seen it in the gossip protocol. So Alice knows that I'm lying. Alice knows that I'm saying one, right? So the game is now in this role. Because as Bob, I have already chosen strategy one. Now, if Alice is rational, she wants to maximize her own payoff. She can say zero and get a payoff of minus two, or she can say one and get a payoff of minus one. Minus one is bigger than minus two. So a rational Alice would accept to be extorted. She would just accept that, well, Bob lied, but it's better for me if I agree with the lie, because in this case, I will only be uh, losing 
one unit, but if I don't agree, I will lose two units. Okay. So this is the issue here. And actually, I think in the previous offering of this course, the very last session was called Be Vindictive. So uh, when you're playing these kinds of games on the blockchain, you shouldn't be rational because if you're rational, other people can extort you. You have to always be willing to punish them when they do something dishonest, even if it loses you money. Okay, But that's, uh, I don't know, more behavioral economics. Right now, how can we solve this? Well, of course, the problem was that the players were not moving simultaneously, right? Bob moved first, and he used that first move to extort Alice. He just uh, sent this message that our Bob is one, and that's what uh, convinced Alice that the game is now in this row, and that's what uh, enabled the extortion. Okay. Can I just use a commitment scheme here? Because in all of these previous cases, I was just using a commitment scheme and that would let me mimic simultaneous action. Can I do it here too? So you see here, for example, in rock, paper, scissors, I had these values of RI. The important point was that each player announced the RI, their own value RI, before knowing other players' RIs. And if this happens here, then Bob cannot extort Alice, right? If they move at the same time, if when each player is choosing their value, they don't know the value of the other player, there is no extortion. And then actually our previous analysis works out, the analysis that said it's rational to be honest. But unfortunately, in this case, I cannot just use a commitment scheme to enforce that. Because suppose I have a commitment scheme. Okay, what would that look like? It would look something like this. Instead of saying that every party sends one bit, I'm going to replace this stage three with a commitment uh, and then a revealing phase. So let's say I take this and instead of this, this is my alternative. I say I have 3A where each party commits to their value. So each party I chooses some NI and then calls commit with HI where HI was the hash of their choice and their nuts, okay? And then I will have another phase, let's call this 3B, in which they basically do the reveal. So reveal R, I, N, I, okay? Now, why doesn't this solve my problem? <clears throat> because the secrecy only works when the players actually want the secrecy to work, right? What do I mean by this? Let's go back at rock, paper, scissors. When Alice and Bob were playing rock, paper, scissors, each player wanted to keep their own move secret because there's no point in leaking your own move, right? So suppose that I'm Bob here and I tell Alice, hey, I'm definitely going to play rock. Uh, if I do that, well, Alice is going to play paper and she's going to win all the time. So I don't have any incentive to leak my own choice. The same thing happens when we're doing an auction. So if I'm bidding, I hope that other people would not outbid me, right? So I don't want all the other players to know my bid because if they do know my bid, maybe they choose a higher bid and then I would lose the auction. But in this case, Bob intentionally wants to tell Alice that my choice was one because this intentional leakage of information is actually what enables the extortion. The only way that the extortion works is if Alice is sure that Bob is playing one. So if I have something like this, there is a simple attack for Bob, even though I have a commitment scheme. 
So again, let's say I'm Bob, I'm malicious, I put down the deposits, I don't send the apple. It comes here. I choose my value RI to be one, so I'm lying that I have actually uh, fulfilled the item. And then I commit my hash. Now at this point, Alice is only seeing the hash on the smart contract, right? And because the hash also has a nonce, Alice doesn't know that I uh, committed to zero or one. Now I can just send a message to Alice and say, hey, I committed to one, but there is no reason for her to believe me. Maybe I'm just bluffing, right? But I can do better than that. I can prove to her that I committed to one because the hash is already on the smart contract. And I can just send a message to Alice and say, hey, my RI is one and this is my nuts. And you can check it. You can check that the hash matches what's on the smart contract, right? So I can prove to Alice that I have lied to the smart contract. And because I can prove to Alice that I have lied to the smart contract, again, in this game, Alice knows that we are here, we are in this role. And because we're in this role, Alice's best strategy is to accept my life. Yes. Okay, I don't understand why. Um, what do you mean here? If the case that we just return one to one, because in that case, I'm supposed to be honest and if Bob tries to. Um, no, because in that case, maybe Bob has given the apple to Alice and Alice is just lying and then she's getting a refund. Yeah. Okay. So again, the really important selling point here is that, uh, well, not, not selling point, the really important uh, problem here with using uh, a commitment scheme is that commitment schemes only work when people have an incentive to keep their choices secret. And in this particular case, Bob has an incentive to leak his choice. Now, the fun point here is that Alice can do the exact same attack, right? So if you have an honest Bob, and a malicious Alice or a uh, dishonest Alice, she can do exactly the same thing. So they put down the deposits, Bob sends the item to Alice, and then Alice just lies, says that the item was not delivered to me. And it doesn't matter if I have a commitment scheme because Alice can prove to Bob that she has lied anyway. And so this means that Alice proves to Bob that the game is in this column. So Alice pro proves to Bob that she has uh, chosen zero. And then again, if you look here, Bob can choose zero and get a payoff of zero, or he can choose one and get a payoff of minus one. So again, Bob can also be extorted. It's a game of who does the extortion first, or uh, I guess whether the item is delivered or not, that really uh, gives you the extortion. Oh, okay. Great. So. In this case, we saw that commitment seems to work. But now I want to go back to the use case that we saw in the previous session. And this is actually something that we're going to talk about for a long time. And this is lottery. So the idea in a lottery was that I have N different people who come in and each buy a ticket. And then I want to choose one of these tickets uniformly at random, and whoever is the owner of the winning ticket would take all the money. Okay. Now, what was our protocol? The protocol was very simple. I had, let's say again, a phase one in which people could do registration and basically buying tickets. Okay. So we actually implemented this. And then there was a second phase in which we wanted to choose a random number. We wanted to choose a random number between, let's say, 0 and n minus 1, assuming that we had n tickets. And we said that the way we do this is by asking everyone to take part in the generation of the random number. So we said that each player i and I call them players because I want you to really think of this as a game in terms of game theory. So each player I chooses some RI, 
And this Ri was supposed to be between zero to n minus one. And again, this was assuming that n tickets were solved, right? And then we would just take the sum of all these Ri's, or if the n is a power of two, we can also take the XOR. It doesn't really matter. Let's say I call that, uh, what should I call it? Let's call that W. W would just be the sum of all Ri's, I from zero to n minus one. And then of course I would take this modulo n and that would tell me who has one. And in the last phase, basically I would say, pay all the money to the owner of W. Pay all the money to ticket W's owner. Okay. Now, we talked a lot about how we can do this. But first of all, let's just look at the basics here. Let's say that no one is cheating. Suppose that they are all really nice people who are choosing their RIs and giving it to the contract. As long as one of these RIs is chosen uniformly at random, the sum is also uh, following the same distribution. The sum is also going to be uniform and random. Okay. So I just need one honest participant. I need one player to be honest. And of course, I also need the players to not know the other players' values. So I can, again, use a commitment scheme here. I can say in phase two, each player chooses this RI, but then I have subphases. So in two, one, they commit, so they call some function called commit, and they give their hash value, and this hash value is basically the hash of their ri value and some big nuns. And then in 2.2, two, two, after everyone has committed, everyone reveals. So you reveal your ri, and you also reveal your nuns. And then, uh, in 2.2, two, two, I can already calculate the sum of our i's, which I call W. And this was, of course, not that. Okay. And we also talked about the fact that uh, every function call should use a constant amount of gas. So I'm not going to have a function that does n sums. Like after every reveal, I'm going to sum it up. Okay. Now, if you look at this from the point of view of what we uh, talked about here, it actually fits nicely into what commitment schemes can do. Because the idea here is that every player is choosing the value of Ri, but as a player, I don't want other players to know my value when they're choosing their values, right? Because if they know my value, they can probably choose their value so that they win. And so, on the other hand, as long as there is one player who is honest in the sense that they choose the RI value uniformly and also they don't leak it to anyone else, the other players don't know anything about this sum. And this sum would be uniform from everyone's point of view. Okay, so this is all great. But of course, the problem uh, that we also kind of talked about in the last session is the amount of deposit that we have to put down. So in this phase one, we said that you register, you buy tickets, but you additionally also put a deposit. Okay. And the idea was very simple. You put a deposit because I should be able to punish you if you do something dishonest. Now, what are the dishonest actions that you can do? You can, for example, choose your RI in a non-uniform manner. Maybe I'm taking part in this lottery and I'm always just choosing my RI to be zero, right? Now, can I really identify that? Not really, because what I'm seeing is that, well, I mean, when I say I, I mean the smart contract here. The smart contract just sees that you're revealing some value 
it can check that the hash matches, but it doesn't know how you came up with this value. And there is no way to check if this was really the output of a random number generator. So if you are cheating by choosing a different distribution of RIs, that's not detectable. But again, I don't really need to detect that because as long as there is one honest person who's choosing the RI uniformly, the whole thing is uniform. The bigger problem is with people who don't reveal. Because you see, you cannot reveal the wrong value because whenever you're doing reveal, the smart contract checks that the hashes match. Okay, so we don't have the problem of cheating by revealing uh, a different value or changing your RI basically. We don't also have the problem of cheating by not committing because if you don't commit, I just don't include your value in the sum and who cares? Right, so you're making the decision not to commit anything at a point where you have no information about the final sum. So you cannot get any advantage by not committing. All, uh, if you don't commit, you just lose your deposit and there is no advantage in it. If you don't reveal, uh, we will talk about that. If you reveal something wrong, you will just lose your deposit. There is no advantage to it. Of course, if you're honest, you would reveal the true value. Now, the problem is when you decide not to reveal. And that's something that can actually give you an advantage. So just as in the last session, suppose that there are 100 tickets and suppose that I have bought 50 of them. So I should have a 50% chance of winning this. But let's say that when we get to this reveal phase, to phase 2-2, two, two, I see what the other people are revealing. I just wait for everyone else to reveal. And I see that this sum is not looking good for me because I know my own values that I have not revealed. And now I'm seeing the values that other people have revealed. And I see that, well, according to this sum, I'm going to lose the game. So if that's what happens, I'm just going to say, I'm not gonna reveal. Now, the problem for the protocol designer is what do you do when someone doesn't reveal? You can say, I take away their deposits, fine. <coughs> but in that case, the deposit has to be bigger than the jackpot, right? It has to be bigger than any money that they can make by cheating in this contract. Because otherwise I would just cheat. I would lose one of my deposits. Who cares if I can, if I have 50 tickets and let's say I can cheat with one of them, I don't reveal one of my values. And this would make one of my other 49 tickets win the whole thing and get everyone's money. I would just do it. It's fine. I can lose that deposit. So this deposit actually has to be more than the total sum of the values of all the tickets, which is, as we talked in the last session, crazy for a lottery. Because if I'm doing a lottery, I'm imagining that like 1 million people are taking part. And I don't want each person to put a deposit of, let's say, $1 million at least. Okay, so this wouldn't work. I can't just say, uh, when you don't reveal, I take away your deposit. But what if I change my mind and say, when you don't reveal, I will just cancel everything, refund everyone, and then we can do the lottery again. This is also bad. Because, again, let's say that I have... 50% of the tickets. And when we get to phase two, two, I realize that I'm losing. So because I'm losing, I would not reveal. Maybe I lose a small deposit for not revealing, but then this would cause the whole thing to go back to phase one, or at least back to phase two, so that everyone chooses different values of RI and so on. So it resets the protocol. And now I again have another 50% chance of winning. And I can just keep doing this until I win. So restarting the protocol is not an option. Having big deposits is also not an option. So we are in a situation where uh, commitment schemes work, but we have to make sure that everyone is forced to reveal. And we cannot force them to reveal by deposits because the deposits become too large, okay? So this is the main problem that we're going to tackle tomorrow. Like, how do I create a commitment scheme 
in which I have no choice but to reveal. 